I'm going to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Marco Giordano, the senior member of the English department, last time I checked, and chair of arts and lecture. It's also last time I checked. Can you hear me? <clears throat> when I first proposed to that committee two years ago that I would be willing to speak on fascism in case we had an open speaking slot in our schedule, we couldn't fill that year, I remarked that it might be too late the next. And when we didn't have an opening that year, <clears throat> I made the same remark the next year while I arranged this three-part presentation by English instructors on related political themes. I've been having to change my exordium every week, so I've just decided to scrap it. Um, let me thank the first presenter um, who spoke last week, my colleague Terry Mulcair, for his clear presentation of the clear and present danger the neoliberal model poses to education, and specifically to community college education, <clears throat> defining terms and naming names admirably. I hope to have extended the discussion by the end of this talk, particularly in the defining of terms through the naming of names, specifically of several of my grandparents, not, not the defining of my personal point of view or the credentialing of personal authority on the matter of fascism, but the defining of the term itself. I consider that the proposition that the political is personal, perhaps the major premise of identity politics, to be a fallacy. Correctly put, the personal is historical. Everyone is a product of the forces of history, and by being that, but perhaps not alone by being that, necessarily political. I would not exist had not European fascism arisen and been militarily defeated, turning my mother into an internal war refugee on the streets of post-war Italy, where she met and married my Italian-born but US-educated and raised father. Her father, Salvatore Morelli by name, will supply the point of departure for the first critical treatment of the problem with the definition of the term fascism, its consignment to the right-wing, black-shirted stormtroopers holding rallies and attacking people in the streets. In Italy, that meant political opponents of fascism, communists, anarchists, socialists, anti-fascist intellectual, cultural figures from Antonio Gramsci to Gaetano Salvemini to Arturo Toscanini. It's only accurate to note that virulent and violent racism was not a part of Italian fascism. That was the spice that, the part, that part of the rest of Europe, particularly the Anglo-Germanic, added to the stew. As Hannah Arendt notes in Eichmann in Jerusalem, only the Italians and the Danes had an honorable record on not turning over Jews to the Germans, a historical fact that directly influenced the variant structures of a scientific experiment, the Milgram experiment which is not to defend Italian fascism, it's indefensible. Jews weren't entirely safe, as the Germans had to be appeased, merely to define the borders of its villainy. Fascism doesn't have to be messianically racist, only its German variant, Nazism does. <clears throat> it can make do with any enemy, just so long as it has one. The enemy, the Jew, the terrorist, the communist, the socialist, the creeping foreign horde, etc., is the indispensable adjunct of the state as conceived by fascism, as the Nazi political theorist and eminent German jurist Joseph Schmidt observed. It doesn't need to be racist to have a heart of villainy. And my grandfather, Salvatore Morelli, was doubtless close to that heart. He earned his first medal for bravery in the regular Italian army at the age of 14 on some battlefield in World War I. Thereafter, he became, in the early 20s, one of the original black shirts. That's their insignia. Um, um, one of the original black shirts, the jack-booted street thugs I mentioned, probably as one of the disgruntled former soldiers Mussolini as well as Hitler appealed to. Before the war was over, he had served over 20 years as a black shirt and had become the head of intelligence for the chief of staff of the governing militia of the Italian state, um, occupying the same position that the head of the Gestapo had with respect to the commander-in-chief of the SS. As one of the top 10 military officers of Italy, he received a limited edition Luger ceremoniously from the hands of Hitler himself. 
The SS was Hitler's second derivative emulation of the Italian black shirts. The first were the brown shirts, the SA, which ran into the same problem with a regular military, which insisted on a single chain of command, as the black shirts did with the Italian regular military. Hitler assassinated the leadership of the SA in the Night of the Long Lines and brought their successors, the SS, the black shirts, formerly under the command of the German high command, also copying Mussolini's precedent. The black shirts pledged allegiance only to Mussolini, not to the king or the Italian state, and their military ventures abroad preceded any formal declaration of war by that state. They essentially invaded the Spanish Republic in the 30s, a war which was started by Mussolini for a regime change to install the Spanish Falange, the blue shirts, arguably the original right-wing shirts, in order to extend the power and enhance the prestige of Italian fascism. It was a mixed success. The first battle, the Battle of Guadalajara, was a complete failure. And the German Luftwaffe had eventually to be called upon to reinforce. Thus we get Guernica. My grandfather earned himself a handsome medal in that uh, campaign and went on to garner gaudy baubles from the Greek, Abyssinian, and Yugoslavian campaigns. None of these were Italian army medals. Half were from grateful fascist police states he'd helped to install, in the last of which he must have had regular dealings with the head of the notorious Waffen SS. Dark dealings, doubtless, but no darker than those of US officials and our allies with the installed fascist regimes in, say, Latin America or Southeast Asia or the Eastern Pacific. Regime change in wars, regime change wars to install right-wing military dictatorships abroad has been an essential part of fascism since its beginning to its continuation as the foreign policy of the United States for the last 65 years, starting with Guatemala and Iran in the early 50s and continuing unabated until now. And that is the first cautionary parallel to remember when one is tempted to confuse fascism with its historical brand name imagery. The buffoonish supreme leader, his goons and henchmen, the, military, the militarized police state. If one thinks Donald Trump, the alt-right thugs and the grim cabinet of right-wing generals are the images of fascism, but that Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, the Bushes and Ronald Reagan, or for that matter, Eric Schmidt, and Jeff Bezos aren't, one is fundamentally confused about the meaning of the term. Mussolini, who should have known, defined the fascist state as another name for the corporate state, a state he went on to observe in which one couldn't slip something as thin as a cocktail napkin between the interests of the bankers, big government contracted businesses, and the military. They were all the same people at the same cocktail parties, along with their serviceable idiots in the media, as they are in Washington and New York today. War, foreign regime change war, in pursuit of their business interests, is their business. And that's why Italians had it in Spain in the 30s, and Americans have it in Syria now. We usually do it by proxy, as in Syria. When that fails, we do it ourselves as in Vietnam and Iraq. Doing it ourselves has the added benefit of building very expensive military bases abroad. We have nearly a 1,000, so many the Pentagon doesn't know, or at least never gives the same answer twice. One is actually mistaken if one thinks that the US builds military bases to fight wars rather than the other way around. These bases form permanent platforms for the overthrow of some governments and the control of others, and serve as security for the government contractors rebuilding the bomb to hell infrastructure that is such a profitable part of our wars. In Libya, the US destroyed the greatest public water system ever built, one of the engineering wonders of the world. Doubtless great contracts for Halliburton and Bechtel ensued. Upton Sinclair, one of the great American anti-fascists, 
whose novel It Could Happen Here about a fascist takeover of the United States, a dramatization of which the SRJC theater department so gallantly staged after the fires, had a memorable definition of fascism. Fascism, he said, is nothing but capitalism plus murder. Couldn't be more accurate. Um, but it could be more precisely said that fascism is capitalism plus organized murder, plus war, perpetual war, as Orwell observed in 1984 and which we seem to be experiencing now, imperialist war, the only assuredly perpetual one since there must always be new territories to bring under hegemonic control and hence perpetual struggle to control or maintain control of them. Fascism, by which I mean at the moment, the exterior historical fascist state may be said to accompany a particular moment in the history of a state, and to understand that moment, we need only follow the symbol of fascism, it's that <coughs> hammer and axe in the, in the middle of the wings there, to follow the symbol of fascism, the fascists, through the history of the family of my other maternal grandparent, the Countess Cesira Machelli Flori, who had to pay to get a previous marriage of her fascist Superman fiance annulled so that he could marry into the aristocracy. The family, the family he married into legitimately traces its ancestry back to a famous general of the Roman Republic the mosaic wall illustrating the family tree is an official Italian government monument. And the symbol of the fascists dates at least back to then, where it symbolized the unity of the peoples united under the control of Rome around the symbol of authority and force of the Roman state. The fascists was wielded by a lictor. The black shirts thought of themselves roughly along those lines there, army was broken down into the units of the Roman army, not the units of the regular Italian army. Um, lictors were the official bodyguards and police of official state officers in the Roman Republican Empire. The number of lictors denoting the rank of the officer, 12 being the traditional maximum, with none allowed within the official boundary of the city of Rome, except in the rare cases of dictators, emergency, and temporary rulers. This may be said to symbolize an essential fact of the Republic, that outside Rome it ruled by force, but inside by discourse since lictors were traditionally never allowed in the forum, even to an emperor. The original meaning of the office of emperor, Latin imperator, was military governor of a subject province of Rome. Julius Caesar was emperor of Gaul. An imperator originally had no power over Romans in Rome, and his 12 lictors were not allowed him in the forum. When the Republic collapsed into empire, Octavian, Caesar's nephew, became Emperor Augustus, the first emperor of Rome, which signifies that Rome was in military occupation of itself. The fascists had been brought into the forum and installed permanently. The institutions of the Republic remained as ours do, there was a Senate which met in the forum meaninglessly. Eventually, it sent the Emperor Tiberius, who had retired to his villa where he had the largest core of prostitutes and collection of pornography of ancient times, a letter to the effect that it had become inconvenient for the Senate to meet every time one of the Emperor's orders had to be officially approved. Would he not consent to a permanent standing approval of everything he ordered ahead of time? How eager you are to be slaves, he worked back. Augustus, sensible of the contradiction in terms of his title, said on his deathbed, the farce is finally over. Unfortunately, it had just begun. By the time of the Emperor Commodus, whom Chris Hedges so aptly compares to Trump in his vanity, corruption, and incompetence, 
By the time it got to Emperor Commodus, it had gone on for nearly two centuries. Now that was the first time the fascist state occurred together with its symbol, which Hedges rightfully compares to the Praetorian Guard, the deep state, the military industrial complex takeover, refers to as a corporate coup d'etat as having ended our republic. All of these are phrases mentioning fascism in American political discourse without actually calling it that. That was not the first time fascism had occurred. The fascist state had occurred once before, when a form of government based on public civil discourse, having fought off a far greater invading imperial power, decided in the power vacuum which ensued to become an empire. With Rome, it was the Carthaginians which left them in charge of the Mediterranean. With the Athenian democracy, it was the Persians which left them in charge of most of it. At that fateful moment, government based on discourse becomes government based on force and naturally targets rational public discourse. Thucydides, the first great historian of state power, lays down the first unbreakable historical law, calls it the great movement, which posterity will have to understand in order not to repeat that everything the empire does to control its subject dominions on periphery collapses upon the center. Empire collapses upon its own center. The fascist rules the forum, and the medium of the forum, language itself collapses, loses its capacity to reflect on the uses of political power, becomes weaponized against the enemy and starts looking for enemies everywhere. Sound familiar? Socrates goes into the street and not only asserts that he has met no Athenian who has the slightest idea of what virtue is, but invents critical thinking in Western logic, one of my arts, to prove it. And he never fails to prove it at the expense of the private militia leaders and public intellectuals of his day. Naturally, they have him killed. Sophocles, of the same generation, gives the first definitive definition of the fascist state in his great play, Antigone, where Creon asserts the right of the state, organized along strictly military lines, to trample upon fundamental and sacred human rights. His son, Haman, in one of the greatest scenes in literature, makes the first anti-fascist argument that such a state does not allow anything that could be called human to exist in it. That his father may as well be the dictator of a desert. Sophocles' father was a wealthy defense contractor. He was a high military official during the war. His father made armor for the army. I suspect there were similar scenes at home. I, as a precocious child of the San Francisco 60s, sure had them with my father. And he wasn't a defense contractor. He was, like most of the American public then and now, simply brainwashed by them. General Electric, the biggest defense contractor at that time, owned NBC. And the president of General Electric was not shy about telling the president of NBC whom he worked for. William Colby, one former head of the CIA, bragged over 40 years ago that the CIA owned everyone of any significance in the media and another head of the CIA, William Casey, declared at his first staff meeting in 1981, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. Today, the consolidation of that media worldwide behind the imperial corporate state, the deep state, the military industrial complex, the shadow government, the corporate coup d'etat, or whatever else you wish to call the fascist state, has progressed much farther. It is global, and it is collapsing upon the center, which means that we can expect the very same playbook that is used upon the imperial periphery to be used upon us. Um, one of the first uses of that playbook was in Italy after the war. Um, the Italians were understandably tired of the fascist state as it had led to their ruin. And Mussolini, unlike Hitler, had never won an election. 
he was installed as head of state by the king, for which betrayal the entire royal family was exiled from Italy after the war. The Italians were ready to go communist in the next elections, not Marxist, Leninist, not Russian communist like all the rest. The Italian Communist Party was headed by the greatest anti-fascist political theorist of all time, Antonio Gramsci. But that suited the American plan after the war as much as Gramsci had suited Mussolini during it, who had, who had to put, as his then security chief said, that brain in jail. So after the war, the CIA and elements of the Italian right wing and the Catholic Church and an infamous Masonic Lodge, which was still active in providing Colin Powell false data for his UN speech justifying our invasion of Iraq, concocted Operation Gladio. This is an official finding of an official Italian investigation and established historical fact. Operation Gladio consisted of a series of terrorist false flags, Railroad stations, bus stations, any place of large public gatherings bombed or strafed, like the Las Vegas Strip or the Boston Marathon, and the violence blamed on the left wing, or in the case of the American public, the terrorists, all to keep the public in a constant state of fear and tension so they wouldn't vote left wing or in the case of the American public, so they would buy into another little chunk of the corporate security state with the sacrifice of what little is left of our civil liberties. It worked then, and it's working now. Total spectrum dominance, as the Pentagon so charmingly puts it. You control the market for the fascist state, and you control the production of it. It's a business model and as such leads us to the term designating the quintessential business model, something synonymous with capitalism, at least in our time, neoliberalism. It's a commonplace in European political discourse to equate neoliberalism with fascism. The president of Belgium's magistrates, a combination of federal judge and prosecutor, is on record as equating the two, as is her sister, uh, the president of New, Ge New Zealand, not her sister in politics. But it is not on her authority or anyone else's that, identi that that identity exists. It is a matter of historical fact. By now it should be obvious that I am not speaking about whether the USA is a fascist state. You don't support fascism all over the world for 65 years and not be a fascist state. Um, that is unquestionable. The question is when it became one, formally, or rather when neoliberalism became its banner. It did so on 9-11, but not the 9-11 you all think of, 9-11-1973, when the US overthrew the government of Chile, which had a constitution practically identical to its own and very nearly as old and installed neoliberalism as the policy and ideology of a fascist military state in the Americas. Back then, neoliberalism was an economic theory espoused by the University of Chicago economists. It consisted in the doctrine that markets were self-regulating, a contradiction in terms since a market is nothing but a set of regulations, which was, repeated, and which was repeatedly refuted by history. Markets are not self-regulating, they crash. But regardless of the invalidity of that argument, all regulations on capitalist enterprise, including environmental ones, needed to be eliminated. After the coup which deposed Allende and installed the fascist Pinochet, the Chicago boys were put in charge of, Chileans, of the Chilean fascist state's economic policies. They promptly drove the Chilean economy into the ground while labor leaders, native resistors, critical college professors, and anti-fascist cultural figures like Victor Hara, Victoria Parra, and Pablo Neruda were assassinated or otherwise disappeared. Thousands of them. It's still going on all over Latin America. The usual fascist agenda. It had happened in Italy and Spain, not to mention Nazi Germany. From an economic pseudo-theory, 
neoliberalism became the bedrock of fascist ideology and as such forms the mediating term between the exterior fascist state, which I have been describing so far, and the interior one, which a full definition of the term must include. The most precise definition of it comes before the term is invented by, not surprisingly, one of the great, or the greatest, critic of capitalism, Karl Marx, who defines it as one of the essential principles of capitalism and thus supports the general direction of the argument Terry Mulcair made here a week ago. That principle is known as commodity fetishism, something Adam Smith had warned against as the chief moral hazard of capitalism without having a name for it. Marx names it and defines it with remarkable precision and economy. Commodity fetishism describes that state where the social relations between human beings become the economic relations between commodities. That's the principle of commodity fetishism. Um, where marketplace value is the only value that is seriously allowed in public policy, politics, or insidiously private and public ethical life. Let us pick up the argument where Terry left it and in his terms. To the neoliberal model of education, the student is a can of Pepsi. It doesn't make any difference what the value of the food-like industrial product called Pepsi is to the human body. It could be toxic, but that's irrelevant. The only value the stockholders of Pepsi are interested in is that more cans of Pepsi are sold to more people at lower unit cost. Throughput must be increased and costs cut to realize the greatest possible return to the stockholder, or in the case of the community college, the taxpayer. Thus, more units and certificate programs must be completed by, in our case, fewer students in less time. That is reflected in what is the tacit contract with the student, that all this will increase the student's value as a labor commodity in the marketplace for labor, which assumes, of course, a growing economy, at least slightly growing economy, where older workers can retire in a timely fashion to make way for younger ones, something that has not been true for decades even before the last crash of Wall Street, the explosion of student debt, and the underfunding of retirement. And is even less true now under the neoliberal regime of austerity, privatization, quantitative easing, which ruined the, economies of, ruined the economy of Chile and is doing the same thing worldwide, in Greece, in Spain, in Europe generally, and here, everywhere catastrophically, in one stage or another. It is suffering from a critical shortcoming of capitalism's definition of value. The only argument for positive value neoliberalist capitalism has is the increase in market value. But market value is determined by excluding what are called exteriorities the cost to the environment, the worker, the public, the planet in producing the commodity, these are offloaded to the state to deal with, and in the fascist state, they are dealt with militarily and through propaganda. Take the major sectors of the economy, big agriculture, big pharma, the defense contractors which also supply your consumer goods, the oil companies, insurance companies, and the banks. And to their costs, all the exteriorities, the taxes they don't pay, the wars needed to secure their supply of cheap raw materials and labor, the immense government subsidies they enjoy, and you will find that they are not economically efficient institutions at all. Quite the contrary. They are institutions of social control. That's what they do. And that includes the schools. Eisenhower, who first introduced the topic of fascism to American public discourse when he called it the military-industrial congressional complex, right after he did so, 
he went on to warn against its influence in education. <clears throat> which, um, which now is bent on wealth extraction, like the rest of the economy, from the population through debt or imprisonment. We're building prisons faster than we're building schools, and we're paying prison guards more than college professors. And the schools are ensuring that an entire generation's income will be wasted on debt servicing rather than directed productively into the economy. The money you're, not, you're paying to the bank on interest, you're not paying to construction contractors to build you a house that you can afford. Um, that is their real economic function. To exploit the economic austerity, neoliberalism has dictated from its very inception as a fascist state ideology in Chile and from the Reagan regime here on, the Reagan regime which engineered that coup to its present collapse upon the center now in the form of that corporate coup d'etat Hedges speaks of. I brought us to the point of the transition between the exterior fascist state and the interior one. <clears throat> but I've run not nearly out of time, although the topic is immense. It requires at least another lecture, if not a whole semester, which is why it is fortunate that our work of literary merit this semester is Orwell's 1984. For the genius of that book is to use the mechanism of the exterior fascism to describe the exterior fascist state, to describe the interior fascist state. And in the end, he more or less agrees with Sophocles, that there exists no room for the human in either one, that the image of the future is, as he said, that of a boot stomping on a human face forever, except that that face will have forgotten what it means to be human and in the interior state of fascism will be supplying that boot itself. That's as far as my written out remarks have taken me. And I wish to introduce at least for discussion the interior state of fascism by telling a story about my grandmother, the wife of Salvatore Morelli. My grandmother, the Contessa, was a gifted woman, a very talented linguist. In order to escape the depredations of her aristocratic family, she went to France and earned, uh, unusual for a woman of that generation, a graduate degree in French literature, which meant that she was uh, licensed to teach French literature anywhere in France in, in French. Um, she eventually um, joined my grandfather in Spain, where a grateful Spanish fascist government was protecting him, but didn't like him very much either, and so spent for most of her life, uh, my early childhood and my late adolescence and adulthood, she spent with our family and with my mother after the divorce. Um, we used to talk to each other. By the time I had finished uh, high school, I could read and speak French, so we'd read the same things and we would have not so much discussions as remarks um, about French literature. Um, also about Italian literature. And I remember at one point uh, I gave her um, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's book, I think it's called Twilight of the General. It's about um, an old fascist general dying. And it was in Spanish, I couldn't read Spanish, so I read it in English and gave it to her in Spanish. Um, she read it and had unmentionable things to say about it. Um, when I was talking about um, fascist this and fascist that and fascist this, and my grandmother, who by the end of her life had conceded that only the Scandinavian social democracies had gotten the nation state right, sat there and listened to me inveigh against the fascists. And then she went back to her bedroom and came out with a marvelous artifact, a black silk scarf on which was printed Mussolini's declaration of war against France. 
a declaration that sent Arturo Toscanini into his state, um, into his ship cabin on his way to uh, get his Cracker Jack um, orchestra playing in Buenos Aires. He sent him into the cabin for a week out of sheer shame um, for what Mussolini had done. The French were her brothers. Um, she waved that scarf at me and she said, I am a fascist. The Contessa always said what she felt and what she meant. She was of the opinion that the social democracies had gotten it right and that the fascists had gotten it wrong. But she said, and she said truly, that she was a fascist. What does that mean? Right? That's the way I would like to introduce the, the, the state of interior fascism, because she knew that she was a fascist, regardless of what political opinion she finally came to. She was an authority on the inner fascist state, if anyone was. Um, and, and, and the way to understand that, I think, is to um, understand what Hannah Arendt uh, says. Um, about those people who are morally reliable and morally unreliable in these extreme circumstances. She says the, morally, the only morally reliable people are not the people who say, I disagree. They are the people who say, I can't. And then there are the people who say, I will or I won't do it. Um, that distinguishes the inner state of fascism. Because when one reaches a fascist state, one has reached a particular point in history where one is really not given a choice. One must be either a fascist or an anti-fascist. One cannot be, as Antonio Gramsci and Alberto Moravia uh, point out, one cannot be one of the indifferenti one of the people who are non-committed. And Gramsci's great uh, essay, Odio ad Indifferenti, um, is in fact read at rock concerts and, 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 and large convocations of non-fascist types in Europe and gets standing applause. Um, the indifferent are fascists. And... Um, and that is what they, that is perhaps the beginning thing to understand about what the interior state of fascism actually is. Um, the, the, the interior state of fascism that we are experiencing, it, it isn't the, the hysterical um, um, fascist in the street, it's the indifferent. And it, it, it and to understand the indifferent, one might understand another classical political theoretical concept. Noam Chomsky likes to mention Shulam, uh, um, uh, Sheldon Wolin's um, inverted totalitarianism. Wolin comes up with the concept of inverted totalitarianism in order to contrast it to non-inverted totalitarianism. The, non-inverted totalitarianism of Nazism and of, of fascism. Um, non-inverted totalitarianism, the good old-fashioned fascist model, um, is a form of identity politics. Um, in, in that form, only the leader really has an identity, <laughs> right? Everyone else's identity is a function of the leader, but the leader is as charismatic as any media figure that we have here. There are multiple gratifications of the need for affiliation, sort of like what one feels for the corporate entities of sports teams. One gets a feeling of the gratification of one's identity by the identification with the grand personality. Um, this requires a certain amount of, of hysterical uh, 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 release of, of the, depressed, uh, the depressed need for affiliation with others that the alienated corporate state depends upon. Um, in inverted totalitarianism, instead of the attraction 
um, through uh, a sort of orgiastic identification with the one personality, there's a sort of alienated clinging to one's own. Um, but a personality that is defined along neoliberal lines, along commodity fetishistic lines. Um, one has brand name loyalties, one has loyalties to sports teams, to, to one defines oneself by one's lifestyle, right? A lifestyle is to be distinguished from a life, right? A lifestyle is a commodity or a network of commodities one buys into. It's the way of defining one's personality by commodities. And it's perhaps the dominant notion of, what, of the identity of the self. Um, at least it's the dominant neoliberal version of the identity of the self. It requires a deep alienation towards oneself um, and towards one's history. Uh, it's essentially ahistorical. And it requires also a deep alienation from others. Because part of the uh, effects, part of the moral hazard of commodity fetishism is to innately believe that human dignity can be distinguished by the, can be distributed by the marketplace. That the people you run across every day, those people who, who don't have a living wage, that somehow that's all right in your community because the neoliberal capitalist model distributes human dignity and it's all right, say, if adjunct professors of, of community colleges or state universities can't afford a roof over their heads in the very counties in which they teach and are, have to live out of their cars or indulge in the sex work industry. That it's all right that the homeless have to congregate under the freeways that it's all right to go through the day with those realities because the neoliberal marketplace and confidity fetishism has bestowed value for us and we don't have to question it or do anything about it. Right? That's what my grandmother means by being a fascist. All right? That's the interior state of fascism. It's the, it's the interiorization of the neoliberal model. Uh, the, the sort of defense, the natural instinctive defense of its ideology, whether wordless or, or articulate. Um, that is being a fascist, being an anti-fascist, something that I can claim to be since I know what fascists are, um, is something different. It amounts to saying something like, I can't, or I will, like what Eric Blair, the name of George Orwell um, did during the Spanish Civil War. Um, he went there and fought on behalf of the Republic. He was shot through the neck and taken to a hospital. Um, he fought on the anti-fascist side. That's being an anti-fascist. That's not having the opinion that anti-fascism is a good idea. That's being one. Um, and what one has to remark upon is that America is not deficient in the tradition of fascism, far from it. Um, it's, the, it's deficient in the tradition of anti-fascism. In the Spanish Civil War, um, the Italian communist socialists and anarchists also organized something like their own Lincoln Brigades, and they went and fought fellow Italians on the battlefields of Spain. That is to say, Italian anti-fascists fought fascists at the Battle of Guadalajara and kicked their butts. They came back to have to fight those very same fascists, my grandfather, in the streets of Italy, so that the Spanish Civil War was a prelude to an, uh, an Italian Civil War that ended up with the fascists winning and taking over the state, essentially, well, thanks to the king. Um, that's sort of what I mean by anti-fascism. Can one imagine that Americans would organize a brigade to fight against our own armed forces in, say, Venezuela or in Syria? Um, 
were we that determined as anti-fascist to impose the elements of fascism in our own country in others where they were, which were being subjected to them? Those are the questions I want to ask. Um, and just more or less keep open. What does it mean to occupy an interior anti-fascist state? That is the question we really should be asking ourselves because we're going to need to answer it. We have to answer it now. There isn't really much point in putting it off. We're in the middle of it. And, um, and fascism is, as I said, a particular moment in the history of the state. It's its penultimate moment before it descends into civil war. Um, and that is another reason why we should be asking ourselves that question, what it seriously means to be an anti-fascist. Because the indifferent will be just greasing the slides to civil war. Um, that's where I want to leave the question. I want to leave the question there, and I want to leave it with Orwell. Because Orwell, as I said, does an excellent job of giving you an allegory of the interior fascist state by using the ins institutions of the exterior fascist state. Thus, Newspeak, Thought Police, the Bureau of Truth, although they have their analogs in our exterior historical reality, also have their analogs in our interior one. It's not an accident that propaganda is born before fascism. It's born in basically at the beginning of World War I. And propaganda, especially as Edgar Bernays and, and uh, Joseph Goebbels uh, uh, conceived it, is there to create an inner fascist state that the exterior fascist state can appeal to. Without that inner state, the outer state is powerless. That's where I want to leave the question. The powerlessness of fascism lies with you. It lies with the unempowering of it in the inner states. And we can only actually begin to do that because the depth of that interiorization has been produced by schooling, propaganda, the total spectrum dominance of culture in the media that the neoliberal mo uh, fascist model has achieved. Um, we're in dire straits. And we have to start from the interior and not just stay there, move to the exterior. We have to be like Orwell. We have to be able to stand up and take the bullet in order to be anti-fascists, at least symbolically. That's where I want to leave the question for you. That's a picture of my grandfather, looking like an Italian luxury liner captain uh, after the war in his dress white uniform. Um, are there any questions? He was an interior fascist, but of the classic kind, you know, a male narcissist macho type. Um, um, but so was his wife, who was not. Yes. I am impressed with your background so much that I have to ask you on any of your classes, do you delve into it deeper specifically? No, not my own background. Uh, uh, I only included as much of it. I'm not proud of my fascist background. Um, uh, I only included as much of it as, um, as was relevant to the speech, but the fascist connection continues. Please, um, question, please. Uh, huh? What was the question? Oh, excuse me, the question is, would I delve into my background? Do I use it in class? And I say no. Um, um, my background is, uh, yeah, my background is, um, um, as I said, the anti-fascist connection continued. So, for example, uh, after my mother was married to my father and living in San Francisco, an old boyhood playmate of hers, or girl, or old childhood playmate of hers, showed up with his wife. Benito Mussolini's son, who um, was married to Sophia Loren's sister. 
and played quite a creditable jazz piano in our, on our baby grand in the living room, after which my father played his usual virtuosic incendiary Chopin and Liszt. And I, always a precocious oral presenter, um, recited Shakespeare in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. And then I was sent to bed. <laughs> um, so let me tell you, I, I, I personally, I understand fascists. They're my relatives, and they're my relatives' friends, and they go straight to the top of the traditional definition of fascism. Um, that's not actually very important. What's really important is for us to understand the inverted sort of fascism that Sheldon Willen describes, and how insidious and dangerous it is to us. Um, compared to that, my family's personal history is trivial. Any other questions? Yes, here. Well, I enjoyed your presentation. Is it on? I enjoyed your presentation quite a bit. I was uh, just visiting the area, and I saw, when I went over to the library, the notice. And I, since I've written almost 300 articles in the last two years on these topics, I feel that I, I can speak to it. Um, I always, when I write, attempt to, as bleak as it is, and I think you painted a justifiably bleak picture. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's totally accurate and from my <laughs> And I've lost quite a few friends, uh, right. mostly old liberals, because I'm an old lefty. Right, I have none either. Yeah, uh, well, maybe we can talk. Yeah. Anyway, long and short of it is, I always attempt to um, look for silver linings. And in the present tense, I have at least two. May I share them with sure, you? Sure, please. I'd be desperate um, for them. In the present tense, we have... Um, I haven't followed it carefully because it's just breaking. The ICC, the chief prosecutor, is a woman, I think, from somewhere in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is attempting to initiate prosecution against the United States for war crimes. Right. <laughs> yes. So that's one. But that, will, that would include all of our former presidents and most no, of the right. cabinets. And I was upset that you <laughs> limited your critique to Trump because I think no, Obama is equally a war criminal, so is Reagan, so are the Bushes, right. so is we Clinton. The there's okay. there's equal said, opportunity blame here. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So I think Trump is a culmination. He made sure. Anyway. And then the second positive thing, ladies and gentlemen, I think, is a woman from Hawaii who's a congresswoman. Her name is Tulsi Gabbard. Are you familiar with sure, her? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, I don't know if any, show of hands real quick. Anybody mm. familiar? Oh, good. This is great. Long and short of it is, she has, um, in her own way, attempted to be anti-fascist or speak truth to power. She has taken on the Democratic and Republican leadership to some extent. She's a Bernie supporter, which I don't approve of. But anyway, just to finish, she has initiated legislation that the United States should stop funding terrorists. <laughs> what a concept. You know, <laughs> to fund them, to create them. And uh, she, along with Rand Paul, the only people I know in Congress, other than maybe Barbara Lee and the fellow from uh, North Carolina, um, Walter Smith, who was a 9-11 truther. Anyway, long and short of it is, she is maybe working to create a new political party because she's taking on, um, she may have to, and, and there are people who want her to run for president. So it's not so much a question, but it's a statement that I look for. Right. Optimistic certainly certainly the beginning of anti-fascism is being anti-war. Yes. And no, being no. anti-imperialist war. Why I couldn't right, him right, him right, him. right. He, he right. No, of course he wasn't. Right. I just would like to point out for those who think Tulsi Gabbard is the Messiah that she, I interviewed with Trump to be his defense secretary. Oh, my goodness. Right. She, she, ain't, she ain't all that great. Huh? She ain't as great as you think. Let me tell you. No, right. And if you want to start a new political party, that'll get Trump elected to a second term. The, 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 this, the, this is politics. Um, Come back. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to have to let you go. We're done. <laughs> <laughs>